Hi, everybody. My name is Seth McGowan, Vice President of the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory, and I will be your host again this evening. And the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory is proud once again to present the third in the Cygnus series. The series of live virtual and interactive educational programs takes place each Friday night at 7 o'clock p.m. We've developed this series in, in a way to continue our educational mission during this period of social distancing and limited exposure uh, in gatherings. So we hope to see you again in person soon, but until then, please register each week for uh, these events. In that same spirit, we are now just about ready to go live with our virtual and interactive stargazing. Um, so we'll be putting something out within the next few days as, um, uh, as a kind of an open invitation to be part of a beta test that we're going to do right from the roll-off roof observatory. We had a great experience last night. We had um, uh, the uh, uh, Saturn and Jupiter um, we were getting the Andromeda galaxy. We had the dumbbell and um, the ring nebula and uh, just a fantastic view of the Omega uh, M17. So Look for that if you see an invitation, and I'll remind you, it's just a beta test at the moment, so uh, you'll be part of the launch of that. So for those of you who might be new to the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory, you'll notice our location is perfectly suited for astronomy, given our class four Bortle skies, but that's not the end. Our Astro Science Center is currently under development and will become an important destination for all ages in the future. The numerous interactive exhibits within the museum will educate and thrill visitors as we Earth beings continue our exploration into space. In addition to the exhibit hall and continuing our hands-on approach to astronomy is our makerspace classroom where visitors will engage in virtual reality, telescope making, and much, much more. Our lecture hall will be a great place for larger groups to hear about the wonders of space and our premier planetarium will take you on trips beyond your wildest imagination. We invite you to be part of the exciting future by becoming a member of the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory if you're not already, and consider a gift of any size to help make the Astro Science Center a reality by visiting our website, adirondackskycenter.org, and clicking on the donate button in the upper right hand corner. And now on to the show. Before we begin, you'll notice, uh, hopefully your microphones are muted. Uh, this is to ensure uh, an enjoyable experience for everybody. Feel free to use the chat feature to uh, ask a question during the lecture. I will uh, then unmute you and uh, do my Larry King impersonation and uh, dial you into our guest tonight, which you'll hear about in just a second. Uh, there'll be a question and answer period immediately following uh, where you'll have the opportunity to unmute yourself and ask questions directly. Tonight's presentation, as well as all of the presentations, are available on, on our YouTube channel the following day, and you'll be provided with links mentioned in the uh, presentation tonight uh, in, that, uh, in the chat area of the YouTube video. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Josh Thomas, Assistant Professor and Director of the Reynolds Observatory from the Physics Department of Clarkson University and board member of the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory to give us the answer to the big riddle of the rainbow. Take it away, Josh. Thank you, Seth. Um, and I think I'm supposed to share my screen, right? Yep, that's the plan. Continue. Okay, so hopefully that's working. Yep. All right, so uh, thank you again, Seth, for that introduction. Um, I'll be uh, talking to you about uh, the spectroscopy of stars. Uh, so without further ado, I will get into this riddle. So stars is in the title, and maybe you know what a star is, maybe you don't, um, but just take a moment and enjoy this amazing photo of uh, M13, as astronomers call it, the Great Globular Cluster, which is located in, very close to the armpit of Hercules. So what you want to, what, what I do as an astronomer is I notice, hey, those stars are different colors. Um, so one of the questions is, why are these stars different colors? Um, and so we'll explore the uh, details of that here in this presentation. 
So a brief outline of my talk. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about electromagnetic radiation, which is uh, maybe scary sounding, but it's really just the rainbow and all of its friends. Um, and we'll also talk about how light is measured, um, talk a little bit about hot glowing objects. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, what we can learn from light. And uh, we'll segue into types of stars. And I'll give you a couple uh, quick inter interesting examples where we look at a really deep level of what is the light telling us about these stars? And of course, there's a quiz at the end. So make sure you have your notes uh, handy. Uh, that part's a joke. Um, so on the right is uh, a photo I took a couple weeks ago, right after a rainstorm that I got stuck in. Um, and this is in Potsdam. And uh, you'll notice the rainbow, which is uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It uh, is composed of all of the visible colors of light that we can see uh, to the naked eye. And uh, what I don't have shown in this crop is that just underneath here is a dumpster. So um, I did not go check for gold. I don't know if it's gonna show up on Zoom. There actually is a second order rainbow here, um, which was quite interesting to see, but very hard to photograph, so. All right. So electromagnetic radiation is just the big scary word that I as a scientist use to talk about everything that has to do with uh, waves that are caused by electricity and magnetism acting together. Um, and so the entire spectrum starting on the high energy end or the uh, high frequency or the short wavelengths are gamma rays. That's the Greek letter gamma. Um, these are the highest energy. Uh, they come from really uh, usually energetic uh, sources in nature. Um, X-rays you might be familiar with. I actually just had an X-ray of my hand the other day. X-rays are quite powerful and can penetrate the skin, but not the uh, bone. Uh, ultraviolet, you know, has a, a little bit of energy. It uh, is known for toasting your skin when you stay outside too long. Uh, and then this tiny little sliver of the entire spectrum here is what our eyes are sensitive to. And this is what you might normally call light. Um, starting on the long wavelength side of that is red. And I learned it as Roy G. Biv, but somewhere along the way in the last few years, they dropped the eye. So uh, it's Roy G. B. V. now um, for the rainbow. Uh, infrared is what you might refer to as heat. Microwaves not only are uh, being used by my cell phone, but are also uh, what we heat our tea and food with sometimes. Also, we use them to observe things in space uh, and also some radio waves, um, which um, Eileen, talked, uh, Eileen, who talked last week, is a, is a radio astronomer. So, I study the visible light. So that's what I'm gonna spend my time talking about. So Newton did this uh, a long time ago. He um, probably made uh, somebody upset, cut a hole in the blinds and let some white light in from the outside and ran the light through a glass prism. And he noticed that out came some different colors of light. Uh, the story goes on, but that's the part I wanna talk about here. So white light's composed of all of the colors of the rainbow. And what I wanna do is think about each of these colors as I'm gonna call them wavelengths. Um, and I want to talk about how bright those wavelengths are. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But there are other ways you can break up light or create a rainbow. Um, and that's with what we call a diffraction grating. And this lower one here in the right is an example of something I use in the classroom. It's transparent. Um, it's got a whole bunch of microscopic scratches on them, vertical scratches. And there's actually 1,000 lines per millimeter. That means there's 1,000 scratches per millimeter. And so when you look through this, it splits the light up into a rainbow. And sometimes you've seen these with like party glasses have these sorts of things. Uh, uh, some light show things that like project things onto your house, use something similar like that for Christmas time. Um, but you might also be familiar, uh, you know, if you know what this thing is, uh, this is a CD. Uh, you also look, see this on the back of a DVD as well. If you tilt it just right, you can see a rainbow in there. And the same thing, there's a bunch of grooves in there. It's causing the light to break up into the rainbow. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about diffraction gratings um, 
because that's what I use. All right, so spectroscopy just means that you spread out something over some measurement. We're calling it wavelength here, and the thing we're measuring is, is brightness. So we want to measure brightness versus wavelength. Um, and because uh, I'm an astronomer and I use weird units, uh, brightness is the letter I on my little cartoon sketch here. Um, I was drawing intensity, which is another word uh, that for right now we can just say is synonymous with brightness. So brightness versus, and then this funny thing is uh, the Greek letter lambda, which scientists use to represent wavelength. I didn't want to write out wavelength. Uh, so brightness versus wavelength. All right, so the thing on the left here, the picture, is of what's called an emission spectrum, or sometimes referred to as, as a bright line spectrum. These, uh, this orange thing here, I think, is the uh, lamp. And then all of these blue lines are images of that blue lamp, but they're, they look like they're in a different place. And that's because this picture was taken through a diffraction grating. And I'll show you an arrangement of that in just a second. But what I wanna do is imagine that I draw a horizontal line with my laser pointer here. And so if I start over here, where the laser pointer is at. It's gonna be no brightness, no brightness, no brightness, no brightness. Suddenly, oh, brightness. And that would correspond to one of those peaks on that little graph. No brightness, no brightness, no brightness, brightness. So that's what we see in this graph. No brightness, brightness, no brightness, brightness. And this pattern is unique to each chemical element. So um, we'll find out which chemical element that is on a couple slides. You see this type of emission spectra when you're looking at a hot glowing object. So this is the giant space eyeball that we use to observe the universe. And this is just to represent some hot gas. So if I look at a hot gas like that in a, a, a discharge, what's called a discharge tube, uh, I see this thing once I run it through a, a, a what's called a spectrometer. All right, then the other type, uh, continuous spectra, have light at all wavelengths. It has this kind of shape. And uh, this is usually observed from hot glowing objects. And this is sometimes called black body radiation. Uh, and it produces basically a rainbow. So over here is another picture that I've taken uh, that shows a rainbow, which was just white light that was run through a grating that was from a hot glowing object. So hot gas, emission line, hot glowing object, continuous or rainbow and then put them together. If you have hot glowing object with gas in front of it, then that gas can actually take away some of the light. And that is gonna result in what we call an absorption spectrum. And so this bottom uh, picture here is uh, the spectrum of our sun uh, at somewhat low resolution. Um, and I just yanked that from Wikipedia. You'll notice there's a bunch of dark lines these dark lines would correspond to the bright lines above for uh, the appropriate uh, chemical elements. And what you see here is the combination of all the chemical elements that are in this gas that's in front of the hot glowing object. And so last week, Eileen talked about uh, E equals MC squared and that uh, four hydrogens become one helium they have a different, little bit different mass, and that produces a lot of energy in the core of the sun. That energy, that, that electromagnetic energy, has to get out of the sun through the atmosphere, which is this cooler gas. And so the dark lines here are, are the chemical fingerprint of the things in our sun's spectrum. So we'll talk about this one in the red here, and we'll talk about the one in the yellow here in a couple slides. I also meant to time myself and I forgot, so. All right, um, here is a uh, emission tube. And it's actually the same type of thing as this open sign at the bottom of the screen. And you've seen one of these. You, know, you probably know what it's called. It's called a neon sign, or at least the old ones were neon signs. Now they're mostly LEDs, but they were called neon signs because these tubes of glass have neon gas in them. And you run a high voltage through them and you get 
them to start, you get the atoms in there to start glowing. So this is also a neon tube. You run that light through a diffraction grating and record it with a camera of some kind. And that's just what I did when I was but a wee undergraduate um, with my uh, friend Noel, who uh, was also a fellow nerd. And uh, we happened to have these diffraction gratings from our class. And he had a 1.5 megapixel digital camera. And we got ourselves into the physics stock room and we set up the lamps and put the grating in front of the camera and took pictures of the spectra. So the thing in the middle is the thing producing light. Off to the left and right is the spectrum. And notice that all the lines are somewhat orangey and red, which is why the tube mostly looks orangey red. Now this was a happy accident. We accidentally left the flash on. And so this is the reflection of the flash in the piece of plastic we put behind this. And that flash is an incandescent bulb, a hot glowing filament. And you see a continuous spectrum. So two, two things in one here, all by happy accident. So this is neon. And neon's friends are helium, the one we saw earlier, hydrogen, which is the most abundant element in the universe, and uh, hydrogyrum, also known as mercury. So in hydrogen, there's this bright red line, this sort of cyanish color, and then there's a blue and not much else. You will notice the color of the tube is mostly reddish. That red line's pretty bright. And this line astronomers call H alpha. And we study this a lot because there's a lot of hydrogen in the universe. And so I'm actually gonna point this out by going back a slide or two to the solar spectrum here. And this dark band in the red corresponds to that red emission line in hydrogen. And uh, just some fun facts about this mercury tube here. This mercury tube looks sort of blue. This is the exact same type of tube that would be in a compact fluorescent or one of those fluorescent tube lights in the ceiling. But when you look at one of those, they, the tube looks white. And the tube looks white because it's a fluorescent light. The inside of the glass tube is coated with a white powder that absorbs ultraviolet. And it turns out that this mercury lamp is outputting similar sets of lines in the ultraviolet. Those, uh, that energy is absorbed by the powder and then re-emitted as white light that we can see. It turns out that this is the exact same type of tube that would be inside a tanning bed. It just doesn't have the powder. So uh, watch out. All right. So moving along, so that so we can tell what chemical elements are in a star or whatever. A brief segue to some other fun things. This is the inside of my observatory at Clarkson. Well, I call it mine, but it's Clarkson's. Um, we have a 12-inch Mead telescope. Light comes in from this side, bounces off the big mirror, reflects to a secondary mirror, and back through a hole. And then it goes into this literal black box, which is our spectrometer. And so inside this black box is a, what I'm going to call this the slit. Um, this piece of metal, this white here is a reflection of sunlight. And there's a little tiny scratch on it, which I'm absolutely certain you cannot see on your screen. I zoomed in, and I'm still not sure if you're going to be able to see it. It's just a little wider than this red dot. And that is where the starlight is going to go through. So when we had these images, these are images, these lines are images of this glass tube at the appropriate wavelength. They happen to look like vertical lines because the tube is vertical. The scratch is actually a slit in the metal, and our spectrometer is going to produce images of that slit. And I'll show you that in a moment. This slit is about the width of a human hair. So that's up here. And then the light goes, bounces off a mirror, goes to this little thing here, which is our fancy diffraction grating, which you can kind of see a rainbow uh, glinting off of. Um, so it just has a bunch of scratches on it. Um, and then that light is sh shines into this red tube, which is a digital camera. 
Okay, so the, uh, I want to talk about, uh, we talked about emission spectra, a little bit how they're collected, talk about the continuous and then the absorption, and then we'll move on. So hot glowing objects, uh, maybe you've seen this sort of thing. Um, you're heating up uh, with a flame here, a piece of metal, and intuitively you probably get that the flame is hotter than the metal. So the flame is blue, blue is hotter than red, and notice the iron. Notice that on the end that it's, you, you probably intuitively know that this end's hottest based on the color, which is sort of whitish, yellowish. And as we go down the rod, it gets cooler and becomes more red. So this plot on the right is of the same type of thing. Sometimes we call it black body radiation. And I've plotted brightness versus wavelength. And notice I've labeled ultraviolet I've labeled visible, which is just between these two big black bars here. And then everything else on the other side is I've labeled infrared. So again, we can only see this stuff here. I've also got three colored curves on here. O stars, or it turns out are the hottest stars. We'll talk about that in a minute. Our sun, stars like our sun are G stars. And uh, M stars are the coolest. So the location of this peak tells us the temperature of the star. And then how it looks to our eye is set by the light that's in the visible part. So the hottest star here is brighter on the blue side, dimmer on the red side, so it appears blue. The coolest star is red. It appear, it's brighter in the red than it is the blue. But our sun isn't green. So what's up with that? Um, well, it turns out our eyes are somewhat uh, logarithmic in their response. And for those that know anything about graphs, this happens to be a logarithmic plot. That's not important. What's important is that this is almost flat. It's slightly tipped to the red, maybe. So our sun is whitish, yellow, which jives with what we know. So what this means is the color of a star, we can tell by the surface temperature, blue, sort of whitish to red, there are not green stars or purple stars or things like that. So putting it all together, we got the, the gas in front on the, on the atmosphere of the sun, and we have our low resolution spectrum of the sun up here. Again, this uh, dark line here in the red happens to be from hydrogen. And then the other one that I like to talk about is the pear right here in the orange, yellowy color. And that is from sodium, the same stuff that's in your table salt. So the bottom image is a much higher resolution spectra where our rainbow is stretched out way, way more. But what we've done is we basically cut it and wrapped it, cut it and wrapped it so we can fit it all onto one computer screen. This dark line in the red right there is the hydrogen. And these two in the yellow are our sodium. And then there's a lot of other stuff in the sun, obviously, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time pointing that out. So I said there were different types of stars, and uh, it turns out we can take their spectra, and then we can arrange the spectra in some sort of organized fashion. Um, checking the time. So notice that the top one here, I've labeled bluest and hottest. This is nice and bright in the blue, whereas the stuff down here is not bright in the blue. So we go over to the other side. These stars on the bottom are brighter in the red. So these are cooler stars. They're redder. And so we can see that right away in the spectrum. So if you were an astronomer and you wanted to classify these stars, uh, you know, come up with a system. Well, it turns out that the stars had already been classified. They'd been classified based on their strength of hydrogen lines. And you'll notice the red, the hydrogen lines aren't always there. They're probably strongest right around here. And it's a little blurry. I know I had to, I really zoomed this in and I'm not sure how well this shows up, but take it from me. There are uh, supposed to be lines here. Um, and this is hydrogen. And there's our sodium. All right, so the next slide reveals the order 
Uh, the number, just ignore the number for now, the letter is the classification. So O stars are the hottest stars, G stars like our sun, and M stars are the coolest. And they have this really peculiar order because they had been previously classified by hydrogen. Look where the strongest hydrogen lines are. A, they were the strongest hydrogen. B, next strongest hydrogen, and so on. So there was some logic, but Astronomers don't like to throw anything away. Uh, if you've ever seen an astronomer's office, it's a mess. Um, so it turns out that they kept as many of the original letters as they could, but reordered them from hottest to coolest. And uh, it was Annie Jump Cannon, who was one of the Harvard uh, computers, or uh, I forget the exact term, but uh, didn't get as maybe as much credit as she should have at the time, but uh, we reordered these from hottest to coolest. So it's O, B, A, F, G, K, M. And you can look up a million different memnonics on the internet. I usually have students in my class write their own. I hate the one that's always in textbooks. I made my own when I took this class. And mine was as follows. Old bald astronomers frequently give killer midterms. He didn't really give killer midterms, and I'm not sure if he'd appreciate <laughs> that I named that I created this after him, but we won't tell him. Um, all right, so putting it all back together, hotter stars are blue, cooler stars are red. Now you look at this pretty picture, and there's a in this picture, right? Uh, pictures are worth a thousand words. Spectra are worth a thousand pictures. So that's a lot of pictures. So it's a lot of information here and now that we think about things that way. So just checking my time again and uh, classificate, classificating, that's not a word, classifying stars um, into the HR diagram or the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Uh, I call this the periodic table of stars. So on the vertical axis is brightness here called luminosity. Our sun is one luminosity, and our sun is here on the diagram. Notice the bottom axis. If you've ever made a plot in your life, this is backwards. The bigger number's on the left. I don't know why this is at all. <laughs> but hotter things are on the left here, cooler things are on the right. Uh, where you see the like nice paintbrush effect is where we find stars. So most stars are on this path here called the main sequence. These are where stars are fusing, fusing hydrogen into helium, doing the normal star things that we you know, know, know and love our star to be doing, the sun. As stars use up their fuel in their core, they evolve, meaning that their cores stop fusing hydrogen into helium and a whole bunch of stuff happens, which could be its own talk in its own right. And they become giant or super giant stars. And Eventually, uh, they end up down here in the stellar graveyard as white dwarfs or neutron stars. Very hot, but not very bright. So bright is this way. Some of them are blue, which means hot, but they're not very bright. So by just looking at the color of a star, it doesn't tell you where it's at on the IHR diagram because it could be a really bright, super giant red star, or it could be a less bright giant star or it could be an M star, but they all have the same temperature at the surface of the star. So that's kind of interesting. If we look at the stars on the main sequence and ask the question, what are their relative sizes? Um, if you've ever heard the They Might Be Giants song, uh, somewhere in there they mentioned that the sun is an average sized star. I don't know what that really means. O, B, A, F, G, K, M. There's the sun. Uh, yeah, so sun's kind of puny. But in the universe, there are many, many, many more of the low mass stars than there are these high mass things. So it also turns out that these are higher mass than these. I didn't say that. But. Okay, so enough about stars. What about this spectra stuff? So we talked about chemical composition, and now I've told you a little bit how we can figure out the temperature of the star. What about if the star is moving? So Doppler, 
effect, which if you've ever heard a train or watched NASCAR or attended a parade where they were doing the sirens uh, or seen a first responder vehicle going by, um, you've heard the Doppler effect, right? As the thing's coming towards you, the pitch is high, and then after it passes, the pitch goes low. That's sound. And so if we want to talk about light, when we're talking about, and I'm using wavelength terminology here, low pitch would be longer wavelength, which would correspond to red, and shifted to higher pitch would be uh, higher frequency or shorter wavelength, blue. So in astronomy, we often refer to red shift and blue shift. And so if there's no motion, you're just looking at a star and uh, with your space eyeball and there's and you're not moving it's not moving then you observe the we could call it the lab spectrum and i uh took this uh rainbow and i sketched on as best i could with a with a ruler uh where the hydrogen lines are so our red h alpha line and then a couple of the other ones now if that star is moving away from us then that causes a red shift, which shifts the entire pattern to the red, which is important because there's lots of different elements with dot, lots of different wavelengths. So how can you tell that it's not just a different chemical element? And the answer is you have to look at all of it. You can't just look at one line. So if we go down and our space eyeballs observing a star that's moving toward us, it's blue shifted, so the whole pattern gets shifted. Toward the blue. All of this is greatly exaggerated, by the way. Um, so we can tell the speed of a star. We can tell if it's moving toward us or away from us. But it turns out we can learn a little bit more. What if we study its speed as a function of time? So we just watch it and see what it does. Maybe it comes toward us and then away from us and then toward us and away from us. What would that mean? Uh, this is actually a GIF. I think it's on Wikipedia. You can go watch the animated version there. So space eyeballs down here. And you have two stars, which is a binary star. Those, that means they're orbiting each other around a common center of mass. This red star uh, called B is moving away from us, indicated by this arrow. And the yellow star A is moving toward us. And so, you know, if you wanted to turn this into a quiz, which of these four would it represent? Um, and it would represent the last one, red shifted A. I'm uh, sorry, uh, I guess it's the one with the arrow, which would make a lot of sense. Uh, a is blue shifted and B is red shifted. These letters and color combinations have really messed my head up, but I, I didn't make them figure, so. All right, so we can tell if a star has, is a binary by looking at its spectra, which is kind of cool. Um, this is all you can, also how you can detect exoplanets and all sorts of other things. So to my couple of examples, and then I'll be done. A um, couple of examples. What if a star, right? I, I told you that you have a hot glowing object, black body, and then we can tell what's in the atmosphere of the star. But what if there's other gas around the star as a shell or as a disk or what if there just happens to be an interstellar glass, gas cloud between us and that star? Or what about Earth's atmosphere? It turns out when we look at a star, we see all of those effects, and then we have to try and disentangle that all. So how do we do that? The riddle. So let's take a look at a star called P. Cygni in the constellation of Cygnus that Jeff talked about a couple weeks ago. So there it is in the red circle. It's kind of faint. So. I look at it with my spectrograph, and my camera records this. A little strip of light with a bunch of salt and pepper up here, and ooh, a dark spot, and well, that's a little weird, a bright spot. So if I go along here with my little laser pointer and I measure the brightness as a function of position on the camera, I get some sort of brightness level, and then, oh, a dip, and then excess. Now, it turns out the salt and pepper stuff here caused by cosmic rays. Uh, it also turns out that if I just did what I said, I would actually have a plot of brightness on the vertical versus pixel, which isn't useful. And this camera's monochrome, 
So I have to figure out what color I'm looking at, what wavelength. And so I do that by taking an image that looks like this. And this image is of a neon lamp. And these vertical bars are the slit through which the light was going. And so I know what wavelengths these are in neon, and I know what pixels they're at, so I create a little map, and I produce this type of thing here. So let's try and figure out what the world, this mess, this riddle, tells an astronomer. So here's that same type of profile. I've labeled it blue and red side for you. I have also labeled in this horrible yellow color the lab frequency or uh, uh, wavelength. So this would correspond to no Doppler shift. So I have cartoon eyeball that is observing this star with gas that's moving outward away from the star in all directions, denoted by the arrows moving out. The arrows are also color coded. If the stuff is moving toward you, it's going to end up causing blue shift. If it's moving away from you, it's going to end up causing red shift. Now, Kirchhoff's rule thing. Mm. If you have gas in front of hot thing, you're going to get absorption. So this dip is caused by the gas directly between you and the star. But then this stuff out here is not in front of the star. It's just hot gas. So that's going to show up as red shifted and, sorry, red shifted and blue shifted emission. Cool. And it turns out this type of profile is called a P-Cygni profile named after this star, but we see it in other stars as well. And there's also something called an inverse P-Cygni profile, which I'll let you figure out what that means. My last example. This one is in uh, the constellation of Andromeda. Uh, there's the Andromeda galaxy. This is from Stellarium. The, my, my virtual background is Andromeda, taken with the observatory at Clarkson. And this little crosshair up here is my faint little star of interest. HD 6226. That's really uncreative, but there it is. This star, we think, has a disk of material around it. So it turns out this star is rotating really rapidly, so it's kind of become a squished ball. Um, but if it were to have a disk of material around it, like a Frisbee, then, and it's rotating too, then one side, in this case, space eyeball is your eyeball. You right now, there, you guys, you're looking at this star. And this blue stuff is moving toward you, and the red stuff is moving away from you. So let's break it down. The, I have no idea what color that is, mustard, let's call it. Uh, that mustard bar is the wet lab wavelength. So look at these goofy looking profiles, right? They're, they're weird looking. We call them double peaked because it looks like one here and one there. So there's the lab wavelength. There's blue shifted emission because it's not in front of the star. Red shifted emission because it's not in front of the star. And maybe a little bit of absorption in the middle, but it's really hard to see. OK. But it turns out that these stars don't keep their disk. They sometimes come and go. So in the bottom situation is the same star, but no emission lines. It's all absorption. So the disk is seemingly gone at that point. These are from different observatories, many of which, uh, well, actually, this is professional astronomers, professional, professional. And this guy is an amateur in, in uh, France, I think. Uh, who has the same exact spectrograph I do, and uh, he actually is the guy that discovered this thing was outbursting, we call it. Um, so if we study how this thing changes in time, and you guys might like the movie version here, um, the peaks change relative height and eventually disappear. Um, and we sort of combine all of that information into this goofy plot on the left, where time increases vertically up, Blue represents roughly one. Red represents, like this current example, absorption or no disk. And when this thing loops again, it will be peaking up above one, which corresponds to the yellow color here. And so the disk appears and then disappears and appears and disappears. 
And we've actually just finished uh, and just submitted to the publisher this paper. Um, and we're really quite excited about it because um, it's got a lot of interesting results in it. So there's two examples of how we solve interesting riddles with complicated spectra. Um, and I guess I'm done. Thank you. Well, that was quite a riddle, Josh. Thank you for all of that. You're welcome. And now is the time where we, we can uh, open up to uh, general discussion, just like we would if we were sitting live someplace. So if you have a, um, a question, you can actually unmute yourself at this point. There's no hand raising, so uh, you'll have to be courteous to those around you. And Hopefully I didn't put you to sleep. No, that was fascinating. It was enlightening. Hello. Oh, huh. oh I think you remuted yourself. Yes, I, I was just making a, a remark. It was very enlightening. Ah. Thank you. Glad you liked it. Although I suppose you didn't say like, you said enlightening. So I'm glad it was enlightening. <laughs> well, I wish I had some of these examples to give when I was uh, teaching physics, because I would always do the spectrums in lab and I would show the, the sun lines and that, but I never went into the Doppler shift like that and, and went into some of the details. So it was, it was very informative. I enjoyed it. Very cool. The, those lines in the solar spectrum are called the Fraunhofer lines for those that might not know. Uh, we, we do have a, a, a question from uh, Jeff or Jeffrey. Uh, so the spectrum we see in stars is sometimes an emission spectrum and sometimes an absorption spectrum and sometimes both? Yes. So in the example of P. Cygni, um, Sorry, too many mouses and computers and things. Um, in the example of P. Cygni, or even this one for that matter, um, yeah, there are, there are absorption lines here from the star. Uh, this is absorption. Actually, this is all atmospheric hydrogen. This isn't even, uh, so that's just the atmosphere of the star. And then filling that in, notice that's still kind of there. Filling that in is the emission from the disk. And one thing I didn't say here is these stars are all really far away. And so even though the light is going through this tiny little slit, the star is so far away that all of that, the star and all the material around it is being imaged through that same tiny little slit. So we have all of this stuff lining up on top of each other. And it really is like looking at, um, you know, the stack of papers that you dropped on the floor and trying to figure out what comes from where. And we can do that by um, although I'm probably not telling Jeff anything, but we can do that by, by uh, looking at with uh, Kirchhoff's uh, rules in mind. So, so yeah, combination of everything. In fact, uh, some of these lines over here, this one in particular, is actually caused by water molecules in Earth's atmosphere. So, and actually this one too. While we're waiting for our next question, I'm going to uh, send everybody a few links Feel free to interrupt me if you if you have a question you'd like to ask. This is the first the first link I'm sending is simply a place to directly donate uh, to our um, capital uh, project, our uh, Astro Science Center. Feel free to visit that uh, often. Uh, the next three are simply our website, our Facebook page, and our YouTube channel where this video of tonight's presentation will be posted tomorrow morning before noon, I try to try to do. How about some more questions? This certainly had me wrapped uh, tonight. Oh, I have a, a thank you and that this was very interesting as a chemistry teacher with an interest in astronomy, so. I, I, I went to college. I didn't know what the heck I wanted to do. I just, you didn't ask for this, but I'm a professor, so I'm just going to blab. Uh, I went to college. I couldn't decide what I wanted to do. And for like two weeks, I was a chemistry physics double major. And um, I, 
realized that chemistry one was the only thing they had in common. So I ended up staying in physics, but then I found laboratory astrophysics. And so I actually did my master's in that. And so I did some stuff. I played around with chemicals and took spectra uh, in the lab for comparison to space. So uh, I guess I did it in the end. Any other questions? even if tangentially related. Uh, Mary has a question. I'm, I'm curious, can, Mary, do you want to ask your question directly? Can you unmute yourself? Or would you rather me ask the question? No, it's OK. Can okay. you hear me? Yes, yes. Um, I don't know if the word is it spectroscopy. That's it. Yep. Oh, good. Cool. Um, was this used in any way to determine whether there once existed water on Mars? Um, yeah, in a way. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not going to know the details on that, but yes, spectroscopy can use to chemically fingerprint uh, any sort of sample. Um, so if you have, um, you know, a way of sending down some light or you look at reflected light, um, there's going to be information in that. And so you can look for the chemical fingerprints in uh, those sorts of things. In fact, we just had recently had a comet, right? Um, you can study the light given off by the tail of that comet with spectroscopy and figure out the chemicals that are there, the elements, um, what their temperatures are even um, to some degree. And so, yes, this can be used to check for thing, the presence of like trace amounts of water in, in Mars's atmosphere, or a little different uh, perhaps, but like when you take, like if you're the Mars, this is the Mars rover. If you're the Mars rover and you're obtaining a sample and you're doing a thing where like you're heating it up and then running the gas through stuff, that's actually called mass spectroscopy. It's the same idea of spreading out something like brightness, or in this case, mass over in, the, in mass spectroscopy, it's time. And so it turns out that when you do mass spectrometry, um, uh, you heat up a sample and you can actually tell by the, the amount of time it takes for the molecules and atoms in that sample to go through the device, you can tell what the mass is. And then because you know so precisely what the mass is, you can say it's this chemical element. So um, a little different, but uh, it's the same sort of idea. Great, thank you. And how does time relate to this, just if I can follow up? Oh, yeah. Uh, so in, in mass spectroscopy, you have, you, you put a little sample and in a little chamber and you heat it up, and then you have a gas like nitrogen or argon uh, that blows the sample out of the little chamber at a certain rate. And some very smart people figured out how to measure how long it takes that stuff to go through. There's magnets involved and then some sort of detector at the end. Um, but it's, at least in the mass spectrometer I used, it was, it did it by knowing the time through the machine. Um, so uh, that's probably the best answer I can give you. I, I, hey. I, I, I would have to like do a lot of diagramming to make that make more sense, I think, but. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. In the meanwhile, I've uh, sent via the group chat uh, a, uh, a message with the link to next week's uh, presentation, and um, you'll be able to register that uh, before the link goes public to everybody else. So uh, if you'd like to hear um, uh, Mike Adler next week on Jupiter Rediscovered, feel free to uh, hit that link tonight and get an early registration in. Thank you very much. This has been a fascinating, fascinating presentation. Um, I know that, that, okay, when we're on Earth, we can see rainbows. Mm -hmm. Can the astronauts in space see stars and rainbows? And if they can't, is it different than what we might see here? Um, that's a good question. Um, so I'll answer the second of the piece of the question, which is, can we see stars? Yeah, absolutely. The astronauts can see the stars the same way you and I can see stars. Um, 
you could probably construct a method for an, for an astronaut in space to see a rainbow. Um, but rainbows are kind of an atmospheric phenomena. So like in my, ooh, wrong computer, uh, in my presentation here, if I go to this one, um, optimal viewing for a uh, rainbow involves, um, so I'm looking in this particular direction and there's the rainbow. It turns out the sun was directly behind my back. And so the reason why you see a rainbow typically shortly after a rainfall is that there's still water droplets in the air. And what's happening is the light is coming and it's actually reflecting and refracting around in the raindrop and coming back out towards your eye. And that's what allows you to see the rainbow. And that's why, you know, it depends on where you're at as to what the rainbow looks like. Um, and, uh, uh, so, strictly speaking, I don't think I don't think astronauts could see like the same sort of thing here. But you could certainly have water droplets in space, and you could make a rainbow just like you can with a garden hose, right? Like if you if you do it just right, you can get you, you can see a rainbow in the water hose stream sometimes. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I'm going to say I don't think uh, astronauts can see rainbows uh, on Earth from space but I'm willing to be corrected. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. What's even more interesting is the secondary rainbow out here is the opposite color order because it involves another set of reflections inside the water droplet. So it's total internal reflection. Yes, yeah. And I'd probably have to dig too far, but I actually I'll be teaching a class this fall where I have students diagram it. Oh, it's right here. Yeah. So, oh, it's not going to work with the virtual, <laughs> but, uh, but I actually made my students uh, pull out a protractor and, and, and figure out the first and second order uh, refractions and in, in the reflections inside the raindrop. Anything else? Yeah, hey, Josh. Uh, first, I just want to say awesome presentation. Thank you. Um, I, my question is maybe just a little bit different about how you could be using this technique. Um, is it just for stars, or when we're doing this like transiting trick, can we actually see the atmosphere, the, the composition of the atmosphere of a, of a transiting exoplanet? Is that Excellent question. I thought I'd heard something like that. Excellent question. Yes. Um, it's a lot harder, but so first thing, stars are bright, but we're cramming that light through that tiny little slit and we need the tiny little slit in order to spread the light out enough through the spec through the grating and all that stuff in order to have enough what I call resolution in order to see uh, all of these lines. So you lose a lot of energy and you end up having to take a long time to take a spectrum sometimes. And then that means you need a bigger telescope and longer exposure times. So if you have a big telescope, uh, you can do a really cool trick. Um, you can stare at your star and you can take its spectrum. And then you can wait for the exoplanet to come in front. And then you can take the spectrum again. And then you divide the two. And if there's anything left over, that's in theory from that exoplanet. And so they've actually used this technique to identify water vapor. Well, I don't know why I'm using finger quotes, but <laughs> <laughs> they've, they've used this to identify water with some uncertainty uh, attached to it in the atmospheres of some uh, hot Jupiters around, exo, uh, around uh, stars. So uh, this technique can work. It's just extremely hard. And, and based on the way you describe that, it sounds like it's it's going to be a very large exoplanet with what a, a, a hot or not so hot or large or not so large uh, star. What what if you had to guess what would be easier? Uh, probably it's the ratio that's important uh, between the sizes of the of the the planet and the star. Okay, but definitely a large, probably a large planet. We think larger planet's going to help. Um, brighter star will help because uh, that means you could have, in theory, a shorter exposure time, and that, that's useful. 
Um, you might also want to you might also want a hotter star, which might mean bigger star because um, when you get to the I didn't say this earlier, but when you get to like the M stars, you actually do start to get water vapor showing up in the atmospheres of uh, a, a little bit. You get molecules showing up in the atmospheres of M stars. Maybe not water vapor per se, but um, you do see water vapor in uh, brown dwarf stars. Um, and uh, there's actually an extended classification of stars beyond the, the astronomers giving killer midterms uh, for uh, Y, L, and T dwarf stars, which are brown dwarf stars. And they have water in their atmospheres. And once again, awesome presentation here. Very informative. Yeah, that's what I hoped for. <laughs> Before we wrap things up, I just want to provide you with my email address. If you have any follow-up questions for Josh, I can get those to him uh, directly for you. Um, and if you have any questions about the Adirondack um, Sky Center and Observatory or the Astro Science Center project that we're, that we're working on, feel free to contact me and I'll, I'll be happy to get back in touch with you as soon as I can. If there's no other questions, Josh, thank you so much. This was fantastic, very informative and uh, mind blowing that uh, <laughs> there's so much detail in that uh, uh, spectrum that, uh, that's, in our, that's in the logo that you provided. So thank you very much. And very thank welcome. you all for coming tonight. Uh, we hope to see you back next week for Mike Adler on Jupiter Rediscovered. So have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks, and we'll talk soon. Thanks, John. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome.